Well, grace to you and peace from and from Jesus Christ, our teacher and redeemer, and from the Holy Spirit, who binds us together in Christian worship. I want to welcome everyone to worship this morning, whether you're here in person or joining via Zoom. We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. I would point out that if you did not get the Thursday mailing from Ann Duncan, you might want to check your junk folder on your email. Uh, the church is converting to a new email, and at least mine and, and Karen's got, uh, got sent to junk in, inadvertently, so um, we're glad you found us. We begin our worship by lighting the Christ candle. Whenever we do this, we remember Jesus' promise in the Gospel of Matthew that wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Now, as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, I would invite you to use the words in the bulletin as a centering prayer to help guide you into this time and space as we listen to the prelude. Let us rise in body or remain upright in spirit as we join together in the call to worship. Sing a new song, a song, a song of, of love for all. all. Sing of the spirit of love, the, the spirit, spirit who loves, loves us all. all. Sing of God's abiding love, that we might love one another and all of the world. Sing a new song, a song, a song of, of love for all. Let us pray. Spirit of love, Abide in us and in our worship. Whisper your song of love in our hearts, that love may flow through every word we hear, every thought we think, every word we speak, and every song we sing. Spirit of power and grace, abide in us, that we may abide in your love and proclaim your song of love for all. Amen. Seek the road. 
We gather as God's people, believing the promises fulfilled in Christ. We do not need to confess out of dread or fear, but in trust that God is faithful to forgive us and make us new. Join me as we pray together. Spirit Spirit of of love, we we come come in search search of love, and in the hope of learning how to love as you love us. Help us to see others with your eyes of love. Help us to forgive and accept forgiveness as fully and confidently as you forgive. Love us, dear God, with the mercy and grace we need to abide in your love each and every day. In your love and grace we pray. Amen. God's steadfast love is ours. God's faithfulness is sure. God's Spirit is with us, embracing us with forgiveness and grace, abiding in us with the power of love for all. We are called to love one another as we have been loved by God. So let us share signs of our love as we pass the peace of Christ together. The peace of Christ be with you. And also also with with you. Peace be to all of you this morning. It's good to see all of your faces. So I want to talk to the kids this morning. I want to take a break from making breakfast for mom. And uh, I wanted to share with you this morning... I got this bag of candy at the store the other day. I love... Starbursts. I have for a long time. Whenever I would go trick-or-treating as a kid, these were always one of my favorites. But in my experience, people can be pretty particular about which flavor they choose, me included. Whenever I have a big bag of Starbursts like this to share with others, and this bag will be in my study for anybody who wants to share, I usually get stuck with all the lemon ones, and sometimes an orange or two, which stinks because I love the strawberry ones the best. Of course, as I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate the lemon ones just as much. I wonder, have you ever been in a group that was choosing Starburst or Suckers only to be stuck with the flavors no one else wanted, like lemon or butterscotch or licorice? Oh. Well, sometimes we treat people like those last to be chosen Starbursts or Suckers. In outdoor games, certain kids are always last to be chosen. Other times, we leave people out from gatherings, parties, or other activities. Maybe sometimes there are reasons, like maybe Joey just isn't really that great at kickball. Or maybe Susie is interested in different things than your friends. Well, whatever the reason, though, it doesn't feel good to be left out does it? So I wonder, when was a time that you felt left out or were chosen last? How did that make you feel? When that happens, whether we are the ones left out or we are the ones leaving others out, we should remember that Jesus taught us not to leave anyone out. In the Bible, he reminded his friends that he loves all of us, no matter what we look like or what our interests or talents are. And he wants us to love others like that too. Jesus said, love each other as I have loved you. Well, today we're going to think about how to love anyone and everyone and not leave anyone out lemon starburst or not. Let's pray. Dear God, 
Help us to remember that Jesus taught us to love one another just as you loved him and as he loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. And remember, this bag is in my study. Anytime you want to pop in for one. Our prayer for illumination. Lord God, by the leading of your spirit, help us to listen for your voice and follow in your paths all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Psalter lesson this morning is Psalm 98. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. 
because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it is getting to be that time of year again. The time of year when high school seniors are getting really itchy about finally leaving high school behind. Of course, if we're being honest, some of them have been itchy since the year began. And some of them have been itchy ever since kindergarten. Now, graduations are coming, and graduations of any kind are major achievements, marking a huge milestone in a person's life. Yet a high school graduation feels set apart from even the rest. As scary as it might sound, it really does mark the transition from childhood to adulthood. After graduation, a student is no longer safely suspended in that bubble we refer to as high schooler. Instead, they are now young man or young woman, college bound or work ready. Now, one of the strangest parts of this transition might be the relationships that can change along with it. When I first started teaching, a number of years ago, I noticed how fascinated teenagers can be with the lives of their teachers. You're a real person? You don't live at school? And how disappointed they would be when they realized how boring my day-to-day -day life really was. Now, about halfway through my first year, one of my seniors discovered that my first name is Kyle. And for some reason, he found this hilarious. So I put it to him like this. Okay, after you graduate, then you can call me Kyle. Until then, it's Mr. Delhagen. And then, not 10 minutes after the graduation ceremony had completed, as I stood out in front of the church building that seconded as our school, among a throng of celebrating families and flashing cameras, I heard, Kyle, Kyle, Kyle! And running up to me with a huge smile on his face was Brunel. Of course, when he came back to visit a couple of times over the next couple of years, he always called me Mr. D, which I find only slightly ironic. And that got me remembering back to my own high school graduation. The principal and my dad had grown closer, close over the years, uh, mostly due to behavior refer referrals for my brother, not for me. <laughs> Our families knew each other pretty well. And my own relationship with Dr. Starr was pretty good. Uh, Yes, I put his car up for sale in the Rochester area newspapers classified ads, and he misplaced my diploma on graduation day, but it was all in good fun. Anyway, I can clearly remember later that afternoon at my graduation party in our backyard how I thanked Dr. Starr for coming. Thank you, Dr. Starr. Shaking my hand, he said, Kyle, you can call me Dan now. That feeling was so foreign. An adult's first name just felt wrong. Yet for all intents and purposes, I was now, or at least almost was, an adult. And I think that this is a little bit of what Jesus is getting at in our gospel lesson this morning. You are my friends. I do not call you servants any longer, but I have called you friends. Now just 
Just take a moment to think about this. Jesus, the Son of God, considers these disciples to be his friends. For three years now, they have been many things. Followers, students, pupils, disciples, sometimes a thorn in the side. And yes, that much time together will, of course, grow any group of people close, but there was always this divide between Jesus and the Twelve. Teacher, students, rabbi, disciples, but now, now they are friends. Now it's a slight change, but it is staggering in its implications. Because a friendship implies intimacy, personal connection, trust, and confidence. And Jesus isn't just talking about his personal one-on-one -on -one relationships with Peter, James, John, and the rest, though that is a big piece of it, but rather it is Jesus' way of describing God's relationship with humanity. If we think about it through that lens, then God considers us friends. The second half of verse 15 reads, I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. Jesus, in his life, death, and resurrection, unfolded for us the entirety of the story of Scripture. Jesus is the lens through which we read everything from Genesis to Revelation. And through this lens, we see one overarching goal of God in the human story. Friendship. Relationship. With us. It is what we were created for, and it is God's ultimate intention for us. Now think about your circle of friends for a moment. What makes your friends your friends? We could say that it is shared interests or common backgrounds or a similar distaste for a rival sports team, but in actuality, friends are people you make part of your life just because you feel like it. There are lots of other ways people get to be part of each other's lives, like being related to each other. We can't help that, can we? Living near each other, sharing some special passion with each other. But though all or any of those may be involved in a friendship, they are secondary to it. Frederick Beekner writes, basically your friends are not your friends for any particular reason. They are your friends for no particular reason. The job you do, the family you have, the way you vote, the major achievements and blunders of your life, your religious convictions or lack of them are all somehow set off to one side when the two of you get together. The usual distinctions of older, younger, richer, poorer, smarter, dumber, male, female even, cease to matter. You meet with a clean slate every time, and you meet on equal terms. Anything may come of it, or nothing may. That doesn't matter either. Only the meeting matters. Now, it can sometimes be hard for us to think about having a friendship with God. Moses being a friend of God? Absolutely. They had many a talk on top of a mountain. I can see that. Abraham and God? I can see them chatting over a desert sunset. But when we think of God, it is much more likely to be in terms of the love of God the mercy of God, the judgment of God. 
you take the shoes off your feet and stand as you would before a mountain or at the edge of the sea. But the friendship of God, it's just not something the God we generally imagine does. Or is it? As far as Jesus was concerned, this is what God is all about. You are my friends, he says, if you do what I command you. The command, of course, being to love one another. So to be Jesus' friends, we have to be each other's friends. Oh, there's the rub. To be Jesus' friends, we must be each other's friends and conceivably even lay down our lives for each other. It's a high price to pay. And Jesus doesn't pretend otherwise. In fact, he models this commitment to this friendship perfectly, laying down his life through death on the cross that we might live. As I wrestled through this text, I gave a lot of thought to what laying down one's life actually entails. Does it necessarily mean death? In some respects, absolutely. Being willing to give up our very lives for others is an essential aspect of true Christian friendship. At the same time, couldn't laying down one's life also mean fully giving ourselves as servants? It strikes me that this, could be, this path could be just as difficult to tread. Because consider this, to give up your life through death for another is the ultimate sacrifice, yet one you make only once. And I don't want to sound like I'm minimizing this type of sacrifice. The courage and commitment it would take is one that I admit to struggling with. At the same time, doesn't it also require an immense amount of courage and commitment and humility to give our lives for others as servants? To live with that choice day after day and to find joy in it? That is friendship. That is a Christ-following relationship. It means being committed enough to set the alarm for six in the morning on a Saturday to go serve meals to the hungry. It means having the courage to embrace and house undocumented immigrants whose safety is threatened. It means being humble enough to fall down on our knees to wash the feet of a homeless man. We're challenged this morning to consider just how courageous these seemingly ordinary acts can be. We know that they are important, and they do take commitment, but they are also acts that the world has deemed unimportant, frivolous, inconsequential, even foolish. The world says, why bother helping those people? Got to take care of ourselves first. But we live by a bigger commandment. One that tells us to care for others first. We cannot help but love. As we heard in our scripture lesson last week, God is love, and by extension, so are we. It is because we have been brought into this relationship, this friendship, that we are love. And our love is so much more powerful than anything else in this world. It is a love that says, yes, those lives matter. And they matter so much that I am willing to give up my life for them. Friends, God has chosen us for relationship, for friendship. In this, we find our ultimate joy. In this, may we choose to love a love that would give us, have us give our lives to 
and for each other. Amen. Let us pray. Abide in us, Holy Spirit. Abide in us with your love. Abide in us with your power. Abide in us that we might love one another as you love us. Abide through us that we might love your world as you love the world. In your love and grace we pray. Amen. We're going to backtrack just a little bit because we, I believe we have a minute for mission from Melinda Riley. Hang on while they unmute you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. 40% of the money from the Pentecost offerings is used for Hamilton Union Presbyterian Church programs. Last year, that 40%, $194, went to the Wizard's Wardrobe Tutoring Program, an organization that provides one-on-one -on -one tutors to inner city children in downtown Albany. It has been in existence for almost five years. I became involved in the program in January. I took part in two virtual training sessions and was provided a packet of educational materials. I meet with my student once or twice a week for an hour or more. At first, we did the sessions by Zoom, but the last three weeks, I have been on site at the Wizard's Wardrobe at 20 Rensselaer Street in Albany. My student is a first grader named Kalia, who attends Giffen Elementary School remotely. We work on phonics, sight words, reading aloud, both by Kalia and myself, and writing. We also work on a STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math project, once a month provided by the program. Presently, there are 23 students, I'm sorry, 23 tutors working with 21 students. There is a waiting list of students hoping to be placed with a tutor. Wizard's Wardrobe hopes to get more tutors, thereby increasing the number of students enrolled and possibly moving to a larger facility in the future. A new training session will be held for tutors in the fall. And I find this program quite rewarding. Thanks. Well, in our worship today, we heard from the Psalms about the new songs that God inspires us to sing. In our gospel lesson, we heard Jesus teaching his disciples a new song, a love song about Jesus' love for his disciples and for the world. Jesus hoped we would all join in singing and living out this new song of love. Today, in giving to others, let us join in this song so that the whole world may hear the beautiful and welcoming melody of God's love. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts and on all of us gathered here, that we may abide in your love, and that your love may abide in these gifts. In your loving name we pray. Amen. People of God, uh, first of all, I want to uh, wish a happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers in our midst. Um, and uh, since uh, since they're on, I believe I believe they're still on. I'll send out a special Happy Mother's Day to my mom. Happy Mother's Day, mom. I'll call later. I promise. <laughs> Friends, let us turn our hearts and our minds toward God as we pray. Loving God. Look with love on your world, the world that you so love, and do not grow weary in your love for us. 
The nations are in uproar. Tensions mount. Militaries arm and rearm. Open conflict within and between nations kills. Refugees languish far from home with no sure route of return. Communities destroyed, families broken, and the hatred of generations is passed to still another. God, do not grow weary in your love for us. Send your spirit to the nations. Diminish the fear and fighting. Establish the order within and between nations that offers mutual peace and makes for shared prosperity. Return the refugee to her home and the child to his father. And let that child raise children without hatred or suspicion. God of mercy, the peoples are ailing. One virus has spread over the globe. Millions die, death tolls are daily and without interruption. Vaccines multiply, but so do viral variants. Mistrust has grown among us and united efforts have suffered because of it. Lives are lost, individuals isolated, employment interrupted, resources strained. Send your spirit to the peoples, heal the nations, strengthen medical workers and caregivers, abide with the lonely, supply the poor, enter the home of those who are alone and those in care facilities. Fill the cupboard of the unemployed and the courage of those who would employ them. Make this a time of reconciling the alienated and learning again how to trust and be trustworthy. God of love, this morning we honor the gift of motherhood and the mothers in our midst. We thank you that you have modeled a mother's care and love. We lift up the mothers in our lives and thank you for the care and dedication that they model and which mirrors yours. Yet God, we also acknowledge that not all have a positive impression of motherhood. Some have yearned to be mothers yet have not been able. Some have strained relationships with their mothers or children. For some, this day is a reminder of having lost their mothers, and for some mothers, the reminder of having lost a child. God, you are present in all of this, in the joy and the pain, in the celebration and the suffering. And we pray that you would hold all of these feelings as conflicted as they may be close to your heart, that you would provide peace and comfort that your presence would nurture and sustain. And we pray this morning that wherever you send your spirit, you would send us. Help us to not grow weary of your world, but to love it as you have loved it. We pray in Christ's name and join our voices together in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
beloved, created by God, go to love all of creation. Blessed with love, we are bound by love. Chosen for love, go now to love, remembering who you are and whose you are. Amen.